Welcome to the Claude R. Hoka Lectureship in Petroleum Engineering Speaker Series at the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm John Olson and I'm the department chair in the Hildebrand Department and I'm the host of this fall's seminar. Our first speaker for our special virtual series of lectures in petroleum engineering is Ken Sorby. Ken is the Cairn Energy Professor of Petroleum Engineering in the Institute of Geoenergy Engineering at Harriet Watt University. He has a first degree in chemistry from Strathclyde University and a doctor of philosophy in theoretical chemistry and applied mathematics from the University of Sussex. Following this, he did postdoctoral work at Cambridge University working on the theoretical aspects of semi-classical molecular quantum theory. He has worked in oil-related research and field applications for almost 40 years and since 1988, he's been at Harriet Watt. His research is in three main areas, on the fundamentals of multi-phase flow through porous media, on, the oil field, on oil field chemistry, and in enhanced oil recovery methods. Ken is gonna to speak to us today on the modeling of immiscible viscous fingering in two-phase flow in porous media with applications to water flooding and polymer flooding. So please join me in welcoming Ken Sorby. Thank you very much, John. That's a very kind introduction. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Actually, it's, it's afternoon for you, it's evening for me. Uh, and <clears throat> all I'm going to do is I'm going to switch off my video in a second for two reasons. One is you don't want to uh, really see me all the way through, and two, uh, you can't see that I'm actually drinking a beer, okay? Uh, I'll just put that off. Now, this, this, uh, this talk is about immiscible viscous fingering in two-phase flow, and I'm going to talk about water flooding and polymer flooding. And it's, uh, 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 it introduces a sort, it's not a completely new idea, but it's an idea, an, another way of modeling this, uh, this. It's got a long, uh, viscous fingering, I'll just say what it is. Here's the structure of the talk here. Let me go to the next slide. Um, no, I just need to know how to work my, it's not, uh, wait a minute. You can advance with your cursor keys, Ken. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying that. It's not. Uh, it doesn't like it. Hang on, just saying. Really on, on okay, your keyboard. Okay. This is the structure of the talk now, actually. And first of all, it's going to be on immiscible viscous fingering, in particular. And there's a, 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 a series of headings here which we'll get to as we go through, and you can read them faster than I can say them. So let's just go ahead and jump straight in, okay? Now, viscous fingering is a, 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 an instability, a fluid instability, which is, uh, in fact, uh, often attributed to Safman and Taylor and people like that. It was actually discovered by a guy called Hill in 1951-52, although the actual name comes from, was actually Engelbert and Klinkenberg in 1951 is the earliest reference to the actual phrase viscous fingering to describe this instability. It's a viscous instability caused by the fact that the viscosity ratio of the displacing phase is much less than the displaced phase. So the black stuff would be oil, the, 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 the white stuff, and this is immiscible fingering. I think it's the earliest published pictures of immiscible fingering. And interestingly, it, the earliest possible pictures, these ones from 1958, uh, show a clue as to something we've not been doing quite right about it for a long, long time. Well, since 1958 really and it's you might notice something Th these these pictures they're actually photographs and they were very clever because what the guys did was the the oil is the black material but the water is actually um uh, refractive index matched to the beads that are in there and so you can see the water fingers very clearly now it might be quite clear to you just looking at this here it's not, not they didn't do any saturation monitoring these are just pictures but you might notice something in the pictures there's definitely water here and oil here, and they don't mix a lot actually near here. So you've got quite high water saturation in the fingers. Now, although that might be obvious, no, it was. It's not been commented upon very much. So you get high finger, high water in the fingers, and the fingers go through as an instability, as you see. This in a porous medium. I'm not talking about Healy Shaw cells. That's not appropriate to what we're talking about here. I'm talking about in porous media. Okay. So the high viscosity, but low viscosity immiscible fluid, immiscible, and you get this, these sort of high saturation water fingers going through. Uh, and here the uh, viscosity contrast is only about 80. Now, if you, we've looked, I've reviewed everything that has any experimental data on immiscible fingering, and there's not very much of it in the literature. But about 10 years ago, a colleague of mine uh, called Arne Skaga in, uh, in Bergen started to do some experiments, which at the time I thought to be pointless. He took very, he took slabs, two, two 
two centimetres. In fact, I advised him not to do it, and I was just wrong. But he took sort of slabs of about two, meet, uh, two feet by two feet, up to one metre by one metre, and he put a heavy oil in them, a very viscous oil, and he did uh, water flooding and polymer flooding. You can read it. And he used, uh, he used X-ray scanning. He used X-ray scanning in a big machine here, and he could, he, he could image the fingers quite well. And by doing cycles of floods, he did a whole bunch of work, and so did a lot of his colleagues. And there's a sort of summary slide here, which was given to me by, by uh, uh, another scout, his son actually. And this has got uh, this, this viscous, viscosity ratio here, right down to a high viscosity ratio here in this above. And you can see the fingering all the way down actually. This is the most adverse mobility ratio. This is the most favorable, about five to one, down to, oh, this is 7,000 centipoise oil. Now, what Skog and his colleagues did was they did water flooding and they got lots of fingering, as you can see. And then they did polymer flooding with polymer typically of about 20 centipoise to, uh, sorry, not just 20 centipoise to about 50 centipoise. And I advised them not to do it simply because changing the ability ratio by a small amount should make no difference. Okay. So he did experiments like this and, and he had very good images of the fingers. Now, these fingers look like the ones you saw at the beginning from 1958, all these years later. And uh, if you look at them, in fact, they, they, they look very similar. But, but the difference in this work is now, he actually had saturations in the finger. And you can see that this is oil saturation. Water saturation could be 60%, sometimes lower, depending on the bypass oil. But in the finger himself, you could get quite high water saturations. If you didn't get low water saturations, the fingers were high. Uh, and, and that was evident, I guess, if you look carefully at the, which I have done, at the, the very early results, and there's one or two other small experiments with no quantitatives on them, but they basically show this uh, repeatedly. And this is an observation, just to keep in mind, it's quite important. Now, having said all that, when you actually look at this, this is one of the experiments here when he had a 2000 centipoise uh, uh, oil, or one centipoise water, and he put in a polymer. In fact, it didn't matter if it was 10, 20, or 50, he put in the polymer, under tertiary mode. In other words, here's the recovery of the oil. There's the water cut, cut coming up here. Can you see this thing here? Okay, here's the water cut coming up to almost, really 90 odd percent, 98 percent water cut. He injects polymer, 58 centipoise in this case, but there's many other cases of 20 or 30 centipoise. You get an immediate response in the water cut and an abnormally high uh, increase, an abnormally high increase in, in the recovery. And it would seem to be completely counterintuitive. It's not what classical uh, flow theory would tell you you would get. And, and this was odd. So about 10 years ago, maybe a little more, this is when this idea came from, uh, Skoga, after he had these results, about, in fact, about five years ago, asked me to come in with him and have a look at these and try and, try and model them. So we tried to model them. And lots of people have tried to model viscous fingering with, with little success at first, until actually I found in my notes about 10, 15 years ago, I found an idea to follow. Okay, let's just look at And this is not my original idea, particularly, but it's, it's been noticed by others. In fact, one of them is actually Kishore Mahanti, who noticed it recently, but I'll, I'll, I'll get there and you'll see where it comes from. And I call this the M paradox. Now let's go back to basics, especially if there's lots of graduate students out there. Everybody knows that uh, when you do these things, it's all to do with the mobility ratio. Now the mobility ratio is, is just what it says, the mobility of water divided by the mobility of oil, so KRW mu O over KRO mu W, because remember the mobility of water is KRW over mu W, the mobility of oil is KRO over mu O, and that's what the, it looks like. And uh, we're going to talk about how polymer improves the mobility ratio and makes it lower later and what polymer flooding is meant to do, okay? Now, having said that, let's just do a little bit of very simple theory. This is, these are quantitative. Here's, here's a, a, a set of conventional relative permeabilities, uh, an oil viscosity of five, a water viscosity of one. So the viscosity ratio is clearly about well, five, five centipoise to one centipoise. And, and we, we, what we do is we do buckley leverett theory and we, get the, we find the fractional flow front height. I'm sure you've all done this in your exercises. And, and I've just noticed something here, that the, the fractional flow is, everybody knows the formula for fractional flow, or, or you wouldn't be listening to this seminar. And you can see it's, it's got a mobility ratio in here. And if you just readjust that, the fractional flow function, what M is, 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 is actually whatever M is, it's, it's fractional flow is just mobility, the function of saturation over N plus one as a function of saturation. And it's a universal, whatever the mobility is, that's the fractional flow. That's what you get it from. 
Uh, and I hear you, of course, you've, you've subsumed the viscosity and the relative permeability. Now, when you do Buckley Leverett again, there's the fractional, there's the frontal height, the SWF from the Welge tangent, all well known stuff. And we find that uh, uh, if we were to do this in a linear displacement, we'd get a nice Buckley Leverett front height front height of about uh, 0.58 or something like that and we get a mobility at the front of about in fact it comes out to be about six in fact because of the rail pounds. Now what if oil and water uh, viscosities were these numbers 1600 for the oil and one centre points for the water because that's the example I use all the way through we've done lots of these very adverse mobility ratios that's the one I use for the rest of this talk. So the viscosity ratio is about 1600 and it's very well known what happens when we do, when we get this case what happens is, there's the fractional flow for the, uh, I've changed nothing, the relative permeability is just the same, the fractional flow is just the same, and if you look at the, the, well the, the, the tangent front height, you get this long finger front like this, and you think, this is really good, because clearly Buckley and Everett is trying to make this into a, a breakthrough of a low viscosity, this is almost like, a, it even looks like a finger, and the mobility ratio at the front though, seems rather odd, because the mobility ratio for a 1600 centipoise uh, here at the front, M is actually 1.22, which is quite stable really. And the one that was five to one has actually got about 6.6 .6 mobility ratio. So this is very odd. So if we took this one here and, and people have done, there's lots of, lots of, by the way, although I said earlier on, there's lots of very little experimental work on viscous fingering, immiscible viscous fingering in the literature. There's tons and tons of work, people trying to simulate it. I mean, really probably 10 times more. And people find this all the time and they put in these uh, uh, flow functions and they get this and this is what happens. So what, what actually, what would happen if we try to simulate with these rel perms and 1600 centipoise in a random correlated field here, I'm just, don't worry, I'll come back to this in a moment. What's the consequences of this in a 2D flood in a heterogeneous permeability field? Now the heterogeneous field here is quite, uh, uh, quite uh, uh, the, low, the lowest part here is 10 millidarcies the highest is a thousand, so it's a hundred to one viscosity uh, permeability ratio, and we do a flood. We just put these data into this in 2D. Now I'm just going to jump ahead and show you what happens. What you get is the so-called wispy ghost finger problem, which you get all the time. Now, what this says is this: in in you see a slight shadowy figure of a of a uh, of a fingering, but it's not fingering because in actual fact. Where the little point is, right in the middle of the finger, the saturation is about 0.02 units above the uh, uh, SWI, which is about 0.17. So that's about 0.19 at the highest. In other words, you get these wispy or ghost fingers. And it's been reproduced by many people in the literature. And they, they th say things like, we're not resolving this correctly, or there needs a higher order method. And many people have seen this as a numerical problem. I don't, as we'll come and see. So that's what you get. No, so how do you resolve the paradox? Now, uh, if, if I take a, 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 a run of permeabilities, I, I do my Buckley Leverett, I put them into here, I get these wispy fingers, which don't look anything like the experiments I showed you earlier on at all, nothing like it. Now, there is a suspicion here, and this is something I think I mentioned, uh, uh, Kisho had this idea, this idea that in actual fact with viscous instability, if you had a one dimensional core, you might have a finger in there. So it's not actually obeying Buckley Leverett very well, actually. It's not, it's not quite Buckley Leverett. So we've got a, as I said, this is all part of this M paradox that, that somehow uh, something's going wrong here. Now, the clue was actually in the fact that in the fingers, the water saturation is high. And likewise, it looks high from the very early results. And certainly the measurements that have been done by Skog and, and, and co workers have shown it actually is high. Looks high, it is high. So how do we how do we approach this? Well, here's what I here's what I'm proposing here, and you just have to bear with me in this. I'm going to do it more or less without proof, and then we're going to look at some results, and then you can cross-examine me as much as you would like. Actually, so the proposed method. Uh, so if we just go to first of all the standard two-phase equations uh, of, of of two-phase flow with with viscous and capillary force, no gravity here because I'm going to work in a 2D aerial uh, flood, more or less simulating the, the slab floods that you saw before. Now, this is fully described, if you, uh, uh, fully described by these equations. This is, th this, this permeability can be uh, 
uh, can be heterogeneous as you like, like the random correlated field I showed you before. Uh, there's, there's relative permeabilities in the mobilities, there's a total mobility, a mobility ratio, and a capillary pressure. Now, in our case, we're going to look at the viscous dominated case. So in actual fact, capillary pressure for our purposes is zero. Now, in actual fact, it's not zero because uh, there must be some capillarity at some scale, because otherwise the, the system is actually ill-posed, in fact, because there's no smaller, there's no smaller length scale. But the, the length scale actually comes from the capillarity at some small scale where cap capillarity will wash out fingers. You can't have one micron fingers if capillarity is too big because capillarity is too big to allow that. Even the pore size is too big to allow that. So I'm taking the viscous dominated case. So that's what we get, this. And, and I'm going to propose, the method we propose is going to be this. Now, I'm going to turn it around. Uh, what we normally do is measure relative permeabilities and viscosities, of course, and we put them into these equations. I'm saying, no, that's the wrong way around. I'm going to say this is an intuition that's been shared by others. I'm going to say, no, 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 no. Let's choose the fractional flow function. That's going to be my input. I'm going to take the fractional flow function and I'm going to say, no, that, that's what I'm going to measure. I'm going to measure fractional flow. And this can be done in systems which are being CAT scanned. You can actually work out the fractional flow by observation or you can match it. Now, so if I have a fractional flow, so I'm choosing a fractional flow, and just to distinguish my fractional flow from the other way coming from real problems, I've called it FW star. Now, if we just rearrange the normal system, then if I choose the fractional flow, it only determines the ratio of relative permeabilities. It doesn't determine the two relative permeabilities. In fact, there's an infinite number. But it's an infinite number. But if I knew one of them, say I knew KRW, I could calculate the other one to be completely consistent with my fractional flow, if I knew one of them. Uh, alternatively, I can make another hypothesis, which is a conjecture, which is now, uh, I, I'll, I'll say a bit more about this as we go through here. My conjecture is this in unstable flow, is that the way you pick them is you pick it such that we choose the pair such that the total mobility is a maximum. In other words, why, now why would I do that? Why would I pick? I've picked my fractional flow, SW star, uh, uh, F star, FW star. I pick my relative permeabilities. Now, the, the viscosities are given, 1,600 and one centipoise. I pick them such that the total mobility is a maximum because this ensures that the pressure drops are minimum and that the fingering takes the path of least resistance because that's what it looks like it does. And in a sense, this is a fluid mechanical variational principle. It's saying that whatever the path of least resistance is, it's the one that gives you the minimum pressure drop, which means, ipso facto, the maximum, the maximum mobility. If I look at it here, so whatever fingering it took, no matter what that pattern is, the way I get the minimum pressure drop by solving this uh, Laplacian is such that lambda t is a maximum. As long as lambda t is a maximum as a function of saturation, then this must have the minimum pressure drop across the whole system. Now, this comes from another observation on the pressure drops so we've got two observations. One is the high saturation in the fingers, and two is the nature of the pressure drops, which drop very sharply in viscous fingering, very, very sharply, much more sharply than the stable floods, which, must, which take the length of the system to develop. And this is the conjecture, and this is the work. Now, there's a second reason why the mobility is high. If you look at linear stability theory, especially some work by Yorksos and co-workers from about uh, 10, 15 years ago, then the form of the rel perm matters inside the two-phase uh, emissible front such that he conjectured that it should have a large water rel perm relative to oil rel perm, but it's the same criterion as requiring the maximum, uh, uh, the maximum mobility. So basically, now you might just say to yourself, ah, why don't you just make it have an infinite water mobility? Answer is, it's not consistent with the fractional flow. So you're ultimately got to be consistent with the fractional flow. And I'll show you some results showing this in, later, okay? That's not, these are the two major assumptions that I'm making to model viscous fingering. Uh, now, the next two are just two steps that I'm using, but they're, they're inessential, as you'll see later, actually, okay? The third thing I'm saying is, well, just to have some numbers and to show you how it works, I'm picking a random correlated field, and I really like these because they have the two main things that rocks have, which is a structure of the permeability and a heterogeneity, a, a, level, a level of 
K high to K low, which you can say is the degree of heterogeneity, and a structure, which is the dimensionless correlation length, which is the, the lambda is the correlation length divided by the length of the system. Now, I'm in a square system in these calculations, just to be likely the slabs that we saw earlier, but that's what I'm assuming. And lastly, lastly, you just choose a, a fine enough grid to resolve the fingers. And the very finest grid is, is, is basically saying that that's the length scale of capillarity is like your uh, very finest uh, grid. And the fine grid should be, I've found, should well resolve the, uh, uh, the dimensionless uh, correlation length. As long as it well resolves that, then basically you'll, you, you, can, you can converge the fingers in the absence of actual real capillary pressure. Now, in, at the end of this, I'm going to give you a reference to a paper which Leah actually has, and she's going to send it to you all. Now, just for simplicity, she's going to send it to everybody in this group, whether you want it or not. Sorry about that. It's just easier to do that. But if you want to, there's a, a bigger discussion of how, you, uh, how I show that if you actually uh, do this and have a fine enough grid, you can always resolve the finger. And I'm going to show you it anyway in, in a result later. So if you want more details, it's in the paper, which you're going to get sent to you. And finally, you just need to choose a fine enough grid that resolves that. And the actual numbers are in there. And I could, I could say more if you've got a question on it later at the end, OK? So that's the method. No. Uh, uh, it's, it's a purely axiomatic method. If any of the steps are wrong, it's wrong. If they're, if they're right or plausible, then it's right. But let's see what it does. So what I'm going to show you first is using this approach for uh, uh, the case that I showed you, I'll show you the data in it. How do we actually go about doing this and, and get, the, get the results of, of fingering? Can I, can I reproduce some results that are plausible? Okay, now we know what we're aiming for because we've seen a ton of experiments and uh, as I say, actually the paper you're going to get, uh, Arna Skauga is a co-author along with a, one, another one of my students and uh, another colleague. So let's see what the results look like. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a, a, a square region, L by L, uh, with a fine grid. Actually, most of the results are 1,000 by 1,000, 2,000 by 1,000, doesn't matter. I'm going to show you the results of co uh, grid coarsening. Here's the uh, oil water viscosity, the polymer uh, uh, viscosity. Polymers are going to show up later. It's got a 1600 uh, viscosity ratio. Now, the average permeability is five, th th these average matter, these numbers don't matter too much, but it's got an average of 500. But the important thing is one of the base cases, and I'll show you different ones, has got a, a, a dimensionless correlation length. The largest one I used is a tenth, a K min of 10 millidarcies and a, and a thousand, milli, a thousand millidarcies for the K max. I'm going to show you what the results are when we make that much smaller. In fact, we go down to three to one permeability, not a hundred to one. It's because you can actually try to trigger fingers by just heterogeneity alone. It still doesn't work unless you do all of the things in the recipe that I'm showing you. So the question mark is, well, assume it's viscous dominated. So PC is zero, that's with the equations we're using. And so what, what, what do I choose for FW star? So that's my very first thing. What do I choose for the, uh, the fractional flow? And the answer is, you choose whatever you like. You look at what the uh, fractional flow front, uh, you look at what, what, what saturation you're looking for in the finger, and you pick one. So in other words, what we did was we used these general forms of relative permeabilities, because relative permeabilities are still in there. You still need them. Uh, but there, if you look at them carefully, you'll notice that they're actually the Brooks and Corey when beta equals gamma equals one, but they've got two extra parameters. They're sometimes called logistic curves, but they give us an extra degree, uh, two degrees of flexibility. Uh, so we've got four or five parameters per rel param, but we, we're not using these. Uh, it just gives you more flexibility in the fractional flows that you can model. And that, this is the one we found best after about three or four tries. But the important thing is this. In this particular case, uh, I think I told you that the, the uh, Initial water saturation is 0.17. The relative permeabilities are zero at 0.17, but I want to have a, a higher fractional flow. At, at, I want to, I want the fractional flow front to be 0.275. I'm not. If I put in ordinary rel params, normal rel params, the fractional flow front with the viscosity ratio would give me about 0 0.18, 0 0.17. It would be here, and we'd have no fingers. I want it to be much higher. I want it to be there, and I'll show you cases later when I make it much higher indeed, if you want to. And, you, and there's cases in the paper I send you. Now, the, the rel params look like this when I do this. And these are the rel params that maximize the mobility. That's his case one. 
And here's another one, case two, where I wanted the front height to be higher, I wanted it to be 0.34. And I can show you some with 0 0.5, 0 0.6. I can make it as high as I like. The secondary fractional flow curve there is the actual curve that pertains to the polymer. If I put in a 25 centipoise polymer in this case, in this case, you can see here the mobility ratio at the front. So that front height is 0.19. If I added the polymer, because of the construction here, it, the, the mobility right at the front would be about 14. Now, that shouldn't make very much difference to the polymer, but you'll see what, see what happens later. So in other words, and in this particular case, this is the case where I've taken several rel params and we've optimized such that you can show that the maximum rel params you can get, the maximum rel param, these are the ones here, the maximum mobility you can get is by these rel params here. And there's two of them in, in here, one, two, three, and four. That, that, that three and four, you can't get any better than that. And the reason that is because those are the only ones that are consistent with the fractional flow. All of these are consistent with the fractional flow, but these are the ones with the highest mobility uh, uh, lambda t above for all saturation. Now, because it all, there's no crossover point, it's not possible, because if there's a crossover point, there would be, be regions where another one could be in for some reason, we, I can't actually prove this, but we always find it, is the maximum mobility is, can always, you can always find it with these logistic curves. So I've picked the fractional flow. I know what the real params are because I, I just take my parameterized form and I, I do a minimization to find the parameters that give me the maximum mobility and they, they converge. And then I go and simulate, go simulate. So if we take the water flood, the unstable water flood with all the details that I showed you before, I'm going to show you what we get when we do three dimensional correlation lines of one tenth, one thirtieth, and one hundredth of the system. Now these look like this, roughly, the permeability. Okay, so this is one tenth, and you can see the dimension of that, that blob of red or that blob of blue looks about a tenth of the system. This looks about a 30th and this looks about a hundredth, roughly speaking, okay? Now, when we actually do that, we can do the simulations. And here's the animation. Now, in this particular case, the correlated random field, minimum k is 10 millidarcy, maximum k is 1,000, but it's got a sort of log normal distribution with an average k of about 500 millidarcy. And now, uh, hang on, I need to go back to my pointer off. Uh, how do I get rid of the pointer? How do I switch this off? Just off. Yes, I do. I need to Just click on the laser again, yeah. Oh, got it, got it. So, oops, wrong. I need to make it this. Okay, so this is the simulation. The oil, the black oil is, is 1600 centipoise, and the, uh, the water coming in, the red water, is actually one centipoise. So it's got a high, mob a high mobility ratio with the rel prams, giving you the fractional flow, which at the front, I said was not 0.1, not, 0.17 is the sat water saturation in the black region. It's 0.27. It is actually at the tip of that finger, it actually steps to 0.27. And inside the finger, you can see going back here, it's getting higher and higher in saturation here. The lighter the red, it, it goes up. And, but you actually get very, very, very well resolved fingers. For the longer correlation length, sorry, for the longer correlation length, you get fewer fingers because the patchiness of the, 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 the permeability resolves the fingers and, and lets two or three of them grow uh, 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 before they do for these ones. This is a hundredth length, this is a thirtieth. There's a bit of randomness in here, but you can see in the very short correlation length, you get very many more fingers. Watch it in the early time. Let's play that again. There's more fingers here than there are here, and bigger ones start to emerge, and the longer the correlation length, about a tenth, you get just a few fingers. If I made this long enough, in fact, with longer calculations, one of them would win, in fact. Uh, but, but you're still in this square system, you can see all the fingers, three or four of them coming through. And the longer the correlation length, the, uh, uh, the fewer fingers you get, as you, as you should do, in fact. Now, what do we see? Oh, sorry, let's do it again, come back. Now, what about the recoveries? Well, the recoveries here, these two for the shorter correlation length, for the longer correlation length, you get slightly lower recovery. But if you look at the recoveries, they're, they're quite close together. Maximum recovery is only about 14, 15 percent, 14, 12 percent. It's only a couple of percent difference. There's the water cuts slightly late, slightly earlier for the longer correlation length. And this is like the very, very early breakthrough that we see in, in the water floods and very poor recovery. Of course, if I have a higher uh, uh, frontal flow like in case two, if you look at the paper on that, you'll get up to about 20 or 30 percent oil uh, or 40 percent if you make the fractional flow front higher. You just choose it higher to match your experiment. Now the other thing about it is 
the pressure, what about the dimensionless pressure drops? Now the highest pressure drop, the dimensionless pressure drops, the pressure drop calculated over the delta PO, the, the oil pressure drop right at the beginning, because that's got a 1600 centre poise, and if you inject water, it drops very, very fast. And in actual fact, even by 0.04, it's dropped to a third or a quarter, 0.04, of a, a, a pore volume. If you look back here, it's breaking through in about 0 0.03, 0 0.04 uh, pore volumes. You get a very sharp drop. And when we actually look at this particular case, this is one of the experiments. We, we, we get, this is, not, this, this is not a match to the experiment. It's just the numbers from the experiment, which was roughly the same as uh, uh, the viscosity that we used in this, this case. You get this, but the point is you get this very sharp drop in, in the pressures. So what have we got so far? We've got uh, immiscible fingering, We've got a method that's rather different from the conventional method using uh, a fractional flow, a conjecture that the uh, mobility must be a maximum, whatever the real problems are, but still honoring the fractional flow. And then everything else is just plug in numbers like viscosity ratio, etc. Uh, of course, I've got to make assumptions about the permeability ratios, etc. And I'm going to do two checks because are we getting fingering because I've taken a high uh, permeability ratio here? I've taken 10 millidarsities for this, so 100 millidarsities. Now, in actual fact, my conjecture here was actually, no, that shouldn't matter, because it's, it's mainly in the fractional flow that the instability is introduced, actually, because I'm I'm I've got a very high mobility, an M of about 20, not, not 1,000, but 20 uh, uh, at the front. So that's quite enough for in instability. So it should actually be not a function, a strong function of the permeability uh, uh, contrast. So the first check I did here was imagine we rescale the permeability field. So are we getting fingering because I've got too high a ratio, 10 and 1,000? Uh, I took it down to three to one, and this is what we get. We get, if we rescale to 10 to one or three to one, we get slightly different fingers, almost the same fingers in the same places, slightly more uh, linear fingers in the lower contrast, but almost identical breakthroughs and almost then very slightly different recoveries, slightly more, uh, uh, less here than here, uh, uh, but, but, but almost an almost identical pressure drop. So it's not, it's not the permeability contrast that's causing this. Okay, is it the very, very fine grid? So the second check we did was, what about grid coarsen? Am I converged? Because I, I first I did, did the first one with 2,000 to 1,000, then I did a, a two by two and a two by two. So that's uh, an eight by, uh, eight, eight, eight coarsening here, four by five, 16 coarsening. And in actual fact, you get the, the, the fingers are qualitatively almost the same, uh, quantitatively almost the same uh, uh, here, slight differences as there should be with fingering, but the recoveries and breakthroughs are, are almost identical. The recovery in particular is almost identical. You get slightly different fingers in different places. And this, this up and downness about it is actually real. It's what you see in the experiment because of which fingers are holding up and breaking through. So it reproduces these things qualitatively quite well, okay? Now, what about, uh, everything I've done so far is, is a conjecture based on my assumptions that I told you earlier on. What if I try to then say, well, what do I get if I try to sim uh, simulate immiscible fingering in secondary and tertiary polymer flooding? So, okay. Now, everything I've done, I've just done it, I've said it's qualitatively rather similar to the, uh, uh, to experiments, but, but now if I, let's go and look at polymers. Now, the first thing we did, if you'll see, um, a typically wrong diagram in polymer flooding is something like this. You see a viscous oil here and you put uh, a water in there and you get fingering and you put the uh, polymer into the water and you get suddenly, the, because of the improved mobility ratio, it's much, much better. Now, to get a result going from here to here, you'd have to actually the amount of polymer you'd have to put in there would, would have to be uh, uh, equal to the oil viscosity or, or higher. And secondly, if you've got any initial water saturation in there, it fingers anyway. So there's two reasons why this is bad. And you can see this in lots and lots of books, e.g. mine on polymer flooding. And it's just wrong. It's the wrong picture, as you'll see in a moment. This is not what happens. Polymer actually doesn't even suppress fingering in very viscous oil which might surprise you. It sort of surprised me because three years ago we found it. Anyway, let's have a look. What we're going to do is we're going to take this case because this gives us our worst fingering because you get the fewer fingers and they break through very easily. Now, as I showed you before, this is secondary polymer. I'm going to run water flooding from the beginning 
and then polymer flooding from the beginning. Now there's, there's the fractional flow curve that I contrived. I just made this up, right? I just made it myself. I wanted to get a higher water saturation here than here to get fingers. I just chose that one. The mobility ratio came out to be 19 at the front. When I put in polymer, the construction is slightly different, but I get a mobility ratio of 14, and that shouldn't make that much difference really. And the front height should be slightly higher, about 0.31 rather than 0.27, just a little bit higher. So how can that possibly make any difference? Uh, we do. So all I'm doing now is making polymer, injecting polymer under secondary mode of 25 centiboys. Now it shouldn't really make much difference, but this is what happens, okay? What happens next now is here's the water flood and the polymer flood, okay? Now, the polymer, remember, is being introduced from day one, uh, uh, day one, from, from, the, from the start. Here's the water flood. Oops, wrong. Miss. Here we go. These, you can see, they look almost the same. In fact, there's, hard, there's not that very much difference in them, despite the fact you're putting polymer in here. Look at them. But what you can see, there's something subtle there. Look. The fingers are in just about the same place. Let me run again. This is just water, this is water with 25 centipoise. Now, the reason you're getting fingering here is because you're getting banked conic water, which is fingering. It's got one centipoise. And it's doing the same fingering as you've got from here. I've only got about 17% water, but that's plenty, plenty to cause the fingering. And then what's happening, you can see the lighter, the polymer is actually fingering down the backbone of the water, actually. Uh, much good will that do you? It's just going into the water phase, but, but it does do you a lot of good, as you'll see in a moment. So the thing, this is very odd. We, the polymer doesn't suppress fingering. So what good is it doing? Oh, sorry, I'm doing it again. Go to right. the next one. It doesn't suppress fingering, but it gives you a heck of a lot of oil. It actually greatly improves the actual recovery. In fact, the recovery goes from about 14% to about 25% over a couple of programs. So the, the, the improved oil recovery is 76%. This is in secondary mode. And you think, well, that's just luck or something. I'm not quite sure, luck or something, because in actual fact, you can look at this, it doesn't seem to change the fingering at all. So why is the one on the right 76% better after you know, half a pore volume or a pore volume? How can that possibly be so? Well, it's what we see in the experiment. And also, but, but, so let's do it in tertiary mode. So it's probably going to go away in tertiary mode, you might think. So what we're going to do is we're going to do 1.1 pore volume of water injection to get a water cut of 85 percent and then we're going to put it in because that's how Skoga and his colleagues did the experiments actually here they did it by letting the water cut get high they put in polymer they saw an instant effect and it was enormous okay this is what our one does now i'm going to show you clip by clip here now I'm not, it's not an animation we've got the animation this is the tertiary polymer flood because it hasn't started yet it started now the pollen so you've got almost the same pattern here the tertiary polymer flood is just starting. I'm going to run it right through now, step by step. You can see the polymer coming in on the right-hand side, coming down the middle of here. Now watch what happens to the bypassed oil in here. It sweeps it very efficiently. And it takes here to a much higher saturation. So the mechanism, in fact, is not uh, uh, frontal displacement or stabilizing. It's not, not neither of those, that's the summary of the tertiary polymer. There's the water injection, there's the polymer injection. It's just very efficiently picking up all of the bypassed oil in the lower permeability by viscous cross flow. And there's, a, and there's a full analysis of this mechanism in a paper I did in 2019, I think, showing it. This is actually, it's improved viscous cross flow by polymer. So if you look at it in tertiary mode, this is where we start the polymer. The water cut drops instant almost instantaneously, and the polymer increases like this, and it's again about 76% incremental. It didn't make much difference. The, the polymer, uh, the, the water flood was so bad that the polymer coming through in tertiary mode didn't make too much difference to the incremental. It still worked perfectly well because the water flood was just so bad and it had formed the channels, uh, in fact, uh, in, in the fingering, that the polymer, when it comes along those channels, causing viscous cross flow. And if you look at it very carefully, which we're, we're analyzing it just now, actually, you see the oil coming from the bypass oil into this finger, and then it's produced from there, just like in uh, conventional viscous cross flow from, from layered systems. Just the same mechanism, exactly. So what have I just told you? So uh, I think I've described to you a, a sort of new approach to the simulation of immiscible, immiscible viscous fingering 
coming at it backwards. We don't choose the row parameters, we choose the fractional flows. Uh, 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 the row parameters are then based, derived based on the maximum mobility of the lowest delta p basis. Uh, and I'm, I'm viewing that like a, like a variational principle. In other words, it would find the, if it finds the path of least resistance, that does mean that for the, a given flow rate, it will get the lowest pressure, or for a given pressure, it will get the highest flow rate, whichever one you like. Uh, the permeability field that I've represented as a, a, a correlated random field because it's got a structure and a heterogeneity, but any, any model's possible, plus a fine grid. Uh, now, after the model is established for water flood, in other words, we're, we're, we're just at the, at the moment, we've now, now managed to match one or two experiments by fiddling the parameters till we get it. So we can match the experiments that, that, that Skoga has produced, but not here. I'm not showing this here. The polymer calculations, after, the, after you've matched it, the polymer calculation is predictive. There's nothing extra required other than the polymer viscosity. We don't have to do any fiddling at all. And if you use conventional rail pounds, this is not what you see. It doesn't explain the polymer action. And the predicted performance of the polymer flood is much, much better than predicted by buckley leverett theory, uh, which agrees very well with the experiment. And there's a whole bunch of experiments now that are out there from Skaga's group, from c -Rite and others, that show that in actual fact, uh, I'll, uh, there's a question with a hand raise. I'm going to finish in two seconds, uh, whoever the hand is, but I'll, I'll take your question first. But the, the predicted performance of the polymer is much better than predicted by classical buckley leverett theory. Uh, which is a one-dimensional theory, which it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't explain the viscous crossflow, of course. The, the mechanism is absent. In fact, in some work analyzing CRH results, I found that about, about, about a quarter to a third of the, of the recovery was, was from a buckley leverett mobility improvement, and two-thirds are from viscous crossflow. Now, what's the relevance of this to large-scale reservoir cases? And that is my last slide. Well, the 2D cases I showed you are purely viscous dominated so there's no size there's no size associated with them i didn't tell you what size my system was that is the findings are the same for a 0.5 by 0.5 2d slab or a five kilometer by five kilometer if the lower cutoff uh, size of the grid is tuned to the dispersivity the mixing in the reservoir so in other words as long as you tune you know what your dispersive blend scale is and you go finer than that and that depends on the mixing zone you assume then the very tiny ones you might see in your experiment will be gone to be replaced by bigger ones depending on the correlation structure and the uh, mixing you see in your reservoir so i think that's so we should be able to see mixed with immiscible fingerings in a 2d packed flood or in a big square reservoir we're just looking in 2d and i think i'd like to thank the paper you can get which will be sent to you is by these uh, authors here uh, and you can get a preprint. It's, it's, it's under review, but I think it's going to be set, accepted by a, a, a paper. And I've finished the paper in January this year on my 70th birthday. I'm very happy to get it out. So you'll get a copy of it whether you want it or not, as I said, and I'm very happy to take questions now, okay? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, I'll give you a, a virtual applause there. Other people can join in if they want to. Um, I have a bunch of questions on the chat, and then I see David DiCarlo raised his hand. Yeah. So let, let, me, um, let me start with Ismail Eltahan. Um, no. And um, I don't know if you can see the chat or not, but let me just read it real quick. Could you comment on how different the outcome would be if the flow is not viscous dominated? And Ismail, you yeah. can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask follow-up if you want. Yeah, do you want to, so the question is, how different would it be if you weren't viscous dominated? Well, in actual fact, we've done a series of calculations for the slab size where we've actually explicitly included viscous fingering. And we get some very interesting results because we've explicitly included, sorry, excuse me, explicitly included uh, capillarity. And we've defined uh, uh, an oil wet and an, a water wet and a mixed wet capillarity. And the, the, the results, once those things come in, I, the, the, the capillary length scale is, is off system length, i.e., say a tenth of a, a, a correlation length of the system, then you get very important different effects actually. And actually it's different, it's quite significantly different for oil wet and water wet systems actually. And that's, that's also been observed. So you, you can simulate this with a real length scale in there, i.e. it's not viscous dominated, it's got capillarity, and you get suppression of fingers as you should do. Uh, uh, and again, there's an interaction between the capillarity and the heterogeneity. Because also if you assume of course that it's say, say oil wet, then you have a double effect keeping the fingers out of the low palm, if you assume that's oil wet as well. Uh, so, so it does have a, a, a profound effect, but what I'm talking about today is when, viscous, uh, uh, finger, when it's viscous dominated. 
because now that we've done the uh, the viscous case and we can get fingers, the problem before is with ordinary raw palms and not not adjusting your fractional flow, you don't get fingers, and the capillarity suppresses the fingers you don't get. So it's a double whammy. You can't. So so to see fingering and the effect of capillarity, you need to use an approach that gets fingers. So I'm no I'm not answering your question and great technical detail but this is what my findings are in, in the short space okay is, is are you, do you yeah to, do you yeah want to come back at me on that one or yep yeah, that's that's great thank you so much for your answer hmm. masha okay. do you want to ask your yeah i have another question for the um uh, optimizing the rel perm yeah um it, are there any other uh, constraints other than just uh, satisfy the the pde no no just, just i found I think this is enough in itself. And, and, and actually, I'm reading quite a lot about variational principles and fluid mechanics, which I, I, I actually, when I worked on, well, oddly enough, I, I think uh, John mentioned it. I once worked on Hamiltonian formulations of classical mechanics. And I don't know, I don't know what you guys know about these sort of things, but there it's all governed by variational principles. Hamilton's principle, uh, principle of least time, principle of least action, Lagrange, et cetera. And so I'm quite used to, to, to working on those. And it turns out there, there are actually uh, fluid mechanical uh, variational principles, which uh, once you get your head around them actually are basically saying this, but they're saying it in a very complicated mathematical way. So I've just taken it, I'm, I, I'm taking that optimization of having maximum mobility as being like a conjecture at the moment, but I think I'm, I'm on the way to proving it. I'm, I'm writing a paper just now on this. I'm asking because maybe real perm, the outcome of real perm would not be, may not be, uh, may not make a lot of physical sense if yeah. it was not constrained to some parameters. Yes, yeah, I know because in actual fact, I, I, sh I did a paper many years ago actually where you can get excellent, you can get excellent fingering of missable flow, missable flow by, uh, people always say take straight line rail perms if it's missable, but actually straight line rail perms for missable flow with adverse mobility ratio are actually wrong. It's the fractional flow that's linear. And when you, when you honor a linear fractional flow for missable flow, missable, not immissable, when you honor that, you get rail perms that go well above one. In fact, they can go up to about five or six quite easily. So they have a, ma a maximum. In fact, I had to get the Eclipse guys to uh, relax that uh, constraint in the clip so I could do my calculations. But we got excellent matches to the missable fingering. So you're right, the, the rail palms are in a sense aphysical. I mean, I've, I spent most of my time working on conventional rail palms and explaining them and modeling them from poor scale modeling. And for, for, for these viscous oils, it's, it's just not, it's not the right approach. And of course, you could actually say, well, hang on a minute. Here's a philosophical issue here. If we get rail palms from buckley leverett theory and put them back in and get the wrong answer, there's something going on here. And the answer is, when you do a, a core flood, and we've been doing core floods in 10 inch cores, two, two, two inch diameters, we get fingers right down the middle of them. And so what we back out as a rail perm is a pseudo already. It's already a pseudo. So that's why, uh, and I was asked in a seminar the other week there, how do I get this fractional flow? Because, but actually, fractional flow is actually observable. Rail perms are not. They're not observable. They come from a model. You measure pressures, and flows, and then you put them in a model and, and believe it. Whereas in actual fact, real, uh, fractional flows and pressure drops are actually direct observables. So, yep. so, so, so uh, we have to rethink what we mean by real problems here. And, and for me, it's just a convenience here. I'm almost like throwing away the concept and just putting it back in there to get the right uh, fractional flow and pressure drop. So Esmail, let me um, interrupt and go to our next Question. So, Masha, do you want to ask your question? I can. Thank you for the talk. Well, we put a lot of things into a model and then believe it. And one one of those things is viscosity. <laughs> what, yeah. what is the viscosity of the polymer here? Is it kept constant or does it vary throughout well, the simulation? In this, in this particular case, and this but me simulations in this paper, it's constant. But um, we're doing, we have a lot of results now. In fact, we published a paper on polymers recently. We have a lot of results of, of in, so-called in situ rheologies of polymers because one of the right. things we're explaining, and we have, we have, we've got the explanation, and I'm not going to tell you, that's all. Oh, but actually, okay. you might notice that <laughs> if, you take, if you take HPAM and you match its viscosity and you take xanthan and you take uh, glycerol and, and uh, uh, viscosified, the HPAM does much better in recovery way, 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 way over what it should do. And we've, we've published a paper of why that's so, but, but uh, 
uh, I've, now, I've nearly, nearly settled it. But in fact, you have to be careful with polymer. Now, these results we're getting here are just, all I had to do to get them was put in a polymer, which when it, full concentration of one goes to 25 centipedes. That's all I did. I did nothing more. But actually, it's doing much more. It's doing other things as well. Yeah, because I think there would be in experiments some some of these effects that are due to the actual viscosity variation that you yes, maybe absolutely, see, maybe yeah. don't see. Okay, but, but the, thank the, you. We're looking at here. You can get with 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 just glycerol, you can get about fifty percent recovery, and with polyclomide you can get seventy percent improved recovery. So it's going better, but the the viscous effect is just the same. And we can see from the in situ X ray results. The, 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 the scanning results, they're not, they're not CAT scanning, they're, they're X-ray, uh, like chest X-rays. And, and we can see from those results that we're getting a much, much better viscous cross law because there's another rheological effect in there to do with extensional viscosity. So it's, uh, it's not elastic, by the way, before anybody asks that, somebody, it's not an elastic effect. It's complicated. All right, thank we're getting, you. But we're getting it. <laughs> but the thing is, one of the things here is that, in fact, the thing I'm, I'm most pleased about, and I told you, I, I, I came up with this idea about 10 years ago, it's just in my notes actually, and we, only because of Skoga's experiment did I try and make it work. But actually, if you can't get the fingers, you can't do anything. You, you can't suppress them if you can't get them. So, so David, you want to go next? Thanks, John. And um, again, thanks, Ken. This is great. Um, I guess you kind of answered my question. The real perm to me is what you measure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What you calculate. And that's right. It's, but you don't measure them. Yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> pressure drops, you measure it's the flow thing. And you measure pressures. In fact, my colleague, Ernest Koga, who's a course in this paper, has a wonderful slide. And it's, it's, a, it's a core with a little meter, like an ammeter on it. And it says rel pounds. Measuring rel pounds. That's a measurement. A measurement's an ammeter, a pressure gauge, a flow rate. It's not a rel pound. Right, right, right. Well, you just you just interpret it as basically how much that's right. Flow the compared to a, a, a fully uh, just a single phase thing. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It doesn't have to fit any functional form. No, 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 no. And, and the one we're using here, I mean, I don't, put it this way. I try to fiddle about with, with just ordinary Cori forms. It's just not flexible enough. You don't have enough parameters. And when I do that, I get too high, uh, I get too low a, a mobility of the aqueous phase. I need to have the flexibility to have, to have uh, inflection points in the rel palm. That's a little hint. So in fact, we, uh, it does matter what form you take for the rel palm, just for fitting purposes. But I, I nearly, I almost dispense with it as a physical rel palm. It's just, a, it's just something that gives me a high enough mobility and the right fraction of flow. And that's what's in simulators. So, 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 so follow up question. So you guys, when you do the tertiary flood, the pressure mm -hmm. drops go way up or how much more do the pressure drops change? Oh, uh, not, hardly, they, they go up, but they don't. In fact, we've got data for that and we've, uh, uh, Skog has shown it in papers and I've got, in fact, I'm funny enough, I'm just working on it a couple of days ago. You get, a, you get an, a secondary spike when the polymer comes through, but it's not as high as the original spike. It's not as high as the original spike because, because 1,600 or 2,000 or 7,000 centipoids oil has a much bigger pressure drop than a, than a polymer at 20 centipoids, uh, well, effective centipoids. You're, you're way down there at 5% of the pressure drop and it jumps to, or 10% of the pressure drop and it jumps to, like, it jumps to about 30%, I'd say, 20%. And then it comes right back down. So it's coming then it comes back down again immediately. Okay, excellent. All right. I'll let other ones go because it looks like a lot of questions. So yeah, so the you got lots of questions here, Ken. So just real quick, um, I'll have Bruno go next, and then Jerry Jensen after that. But Ken, if if you don't mind, if you could oh, no, turn fine, on your video. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm just okay. Was a... go ahead, Bruno. Oh, hi, thank you for the talk. So my question is, uh, is this new approach aff affected by the grid orientation effects? No, good, good question, yeah, almost certainly. Uh, the question is, is it affected by grid orientation? It, it's not, it, in these calculations, in most of my base case ones, it's not because, I'll and I'll tell you why I know, because I've used a correlation lens a lot of the calculations are done on the one tenth and and in the paper the one fifteenth correlation length, which means that in any patch of permeability, I've usually got about ten by ten patches that are very 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 similar. In other words, almost homogeneous. And I've also got a, a fixed flow direction left to right. And I did I did things like using a nine point scheme and, and grid refinement. And I, I could see nothing. 
nothing at all. You couldn't see any difference at all. Uh, so uh, there may be, be, I'm sure there would be, I'm sure one could contrive a case, like say in a chessboard pattern or something where you would see that, but I don't see it in these calculations, I don't think. Good okay. question. Okay, thank you. So uh, Jerry Jensen next, and then I'm going to let Kishore has his hand up. So Kishore, you can go after Jerry. Okay. Okay, Ken. So um, with the with the maximization of the mobility, um, wouldn't that just be consistent with uh, the second law of thermodynamics, where your 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 max for a given entropy increase, you're basically maximizing the the amount of flow or maximizing the amount of work you do. Well, it, it's, it's like that, but I, I, I have a, actually done a bit of work in the, the second law myself, and uh, it, I don't think it's exactly, it's not an entropy thing, it's an energy thing. It's a minimum energy rather than a maximum entropy, because you don't, you don't have a... Um, well, they're mirror images of, the, of one another. They are mirror images, yes. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm taking it from an energy perspective, really. But right. it's, it's definitely, if you take it from the, uh, the energy side, then you're saying to yourself, if I have a given, and it's very clear in the Laplacian that I showed actually here, that, mm -hmm. wait a minute, let's just go, if I find that one again, wherever, wherever it was here. Yeah, here, no, where is it? No, oh, here, here, wait a minute, just give me one second. Uh, here, it's very clear in here that if you look at this Laplacian here, then basically you're saying that whatever that is there, that's what the, that's what the, uh, the total pressure drop's got to be. So that's got to be a maximum it, 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 to get a minimum pressure. Now, an interesting secondary thing is almost about the stability, the thermodynamic stability. If you look at the second derivative, it says, it says actually that not only it should be a maximum, it should be a maximum of all saturations. And when we actually calculated them for real systems here, that's exactly what we found. We always found that if the saturate for the maximum ability, it's always the maximum ability. It doesn't, it can't cross over. I think that would be against thermodynamics to cross over. Because right. it could mean there are two paths that would be just the same energy. And so it could be metastable. Right. Uh, but, but I don't know if that's possible or not. It's a bit, uh, bit beyond my pay grade, I think, to sort out when I was at my age. Okay. And, and I would just uh, note that um, a, a former colleague of mine, Ian Gates at uh, University of Calgary, was uh, looking at some heavy oil displacements and he was getting rel perms greater than one. Um, yeah. But yeah. I can't remember if he was using SAG D or if he was, uh, you know, displacing with water or what. But I can, I'll, I'll uh, by email, I'll send you that, that paper. I'd, I'd like to say that there are, there are in fact, in, in when, when you look at water rel per, what, sorry, water permeability, uh, in these experiments, and we and we see it in, in the, these Norwegian experiments we're looking at, when you put the water through, you can get a higher permeability than the single phase water, and it could be a viscous lubrication effect, which has been known since the the 50s actually, and this has been interpreted since the 50s. So you can get apparent rel perms bigger than one just from lubrication of viscous oil and oil uh, water floating over it. If you know what I mean. Right, right. But but, but I, I, I don't know for sure. But but this is I don't know. And I know there are some people actually in Canada who work a lot in heavy oil, but they've got great experience on it. I've read a lot of the papers. And some people there, uh, a guy uh, I once spoke to, I think his name's Maini, Maini, Maini? Bridge Maini. I think I, yeah, I think I said, I think he told me that he doesn't believe in rail prones for heavy oil. And I, at the time, I didn't know what he meant, but I think I know what he means now. <laughs> All right, thanks, Ken. Okay. Sorry, Kishore, you wanted to? Yeah, excellent talk, Ken. Um, really, really enjoyed it. Uh, my question is, uh, let's stick with this uh, slide you have. So one, two, three, four are different choices of relative permeability, is that right? Yes, yes. Yeah. The, 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 the rel perms here are the ones, you can only see one here. Right. right. The one that's converged, the blue one, in fact, it's number one or four, it doesn't matter, They're, they almost overlap. But what we did was we, we, we plotted a few of them. We, yeah. we started off with this one here which we knew was quite a low mobility. In fact, in fact, if you put these one in, it's stable. This is stable. Yeah. Yeah. The mobility ratio is about two. So, but so, I, and yeah. so the final relative permeability or the fractional flow you choose is a function of the viscosity ratio. No, no, the fractional flow is, is irrespective of viscosity ratio at the bit when I choose it. 
When I choose the fractional flow, I just do it. In, th in this particular case, you might think it's rather funny. Why did I pick 0.34? Because in the fingers of one of Stogoga's experiments, that's what he measured. And yeah. so I pick, I, I want to get the finger uh, uh, saturation correct. So I go and match that. And then I say to myself, well, what's the viscosity ratio? And that's a given. Yeah. Because we know that. Right. So at that point, I've got two things. I've got fractional flow and a viscosity ratio. And then if you go back to the equations earlier on in the, that I presented there, um, I, I then say, okay, I've got two rel params and I only know the ratio. Yeah. Okay. So, so, I, so I, I've got, you can do it two ways. One is you can fix one of them and adjust the other one. And that's what we did. But we found that we let them both go free and, and, and do an optimization, do an optimizer. And it's very easy. You soon find, and the conversion three, four goes. So I just put in here what some of the rail plans were on the way to getting there. The number two on there is the on the way to getting that answer on the left hand side. And then if I, once I've got this one, <coughs> can you see my uh, uh, pointer, uh, Kishore? Yeah. 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 Once you get there, you can't do any better. We found we couldn't do any better. We adjust it and it was always. But this is with, called that 2000 centipoise oil or something, right? Like 1600 it was in this. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. But if I have 100 centipoise oil, would your oh, yeah. thing will be different or? No, well, I, I, oh. the, the thing is, if it goes completely stable, yeah, that's then, we're, then we're back into where the rel param is perfectly okay and one dimensional Buckley Leverett theory is more or less correct. I wouldn't have allowed for capillarity and end effects and blah, 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 but you're probably fine. But at these high viscosity ratios, and they're not, by the way, the mobility you might notice here is, is, is in fact, there's a little artifact here you might notice is that the mobility here is about 13, which is enough to get plenty to get yeah. uh, fingering. And when you add polymer, it goes up a bit. Yeah. And that's, that's rather counterintuitive. And it's because we're taking the, the conventional construction of it. But in the in the, um, uh, 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 the, the, the this um, fractional flow here is just the one that by changing the viscosity to twenty five centipoise we get. So yeah. the frontal height you get just comes out of the simulator. It's not but really you that. You keep the same relative permeabilities for all. Yeah, the I keep the same. Yeah. yeah, if you look at some of the experiments from Total and others who have been trying to match polymer floods doing the performance they do in viscous oil, they have to change the rel pounds. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah. You, 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 you've got, a, you've got a, a paper, well, you know this, uh, yeah. but for the others, you've got a paper where you conjectured this about viscous oil with, with a, a, I think it's a Chinese student, yeah? Yeah, yeah, right. right. And, and I read that, uh, uh, I mean, as I said, I had this idea a while ago, but looking at it there, and you found that, I think you, you conjectured that the, the part, you've got to go back to the fractional flow because it's simply not right for, yes. and yeah. you have to do, and you used it to actually get the re recoveries in a, in a way, you have to change it, yeah? Right, right. Yeah. Well, I fully agree with that. You do have to change it because it's wrong. And so what I'm doing is I'm sort of using it locally inside the finger, and then I'm trying to model the fingers explicitly. So I've taken a slight turn from what you did, actually, yeah? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay. So, but I think uh, Hao Feng is that correct? Who was the next one on the list? If 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 you had a question, um, he had a question. I could read it to, you or he can come in, um, or she. Sorry, I don't know. Um, they're still here. If you're here, please just unmute yourself and speak up. Yes. Hello. I I I think maybe you're talking to me. I, I didn't quite hear. It. Okay. Great. Okay, great. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation. Thanks very much for the talk. I really appreciate it. Very, very excellent talk. Um, I have a quick question. Um, the experiments, uh, actually, the, the simulation results you show, it doesn't include the absorption effects, and I see also the, the fraction no. of the curve. No, no, nothing at all. No, it's, it's, a, it's a completely, this is a completely fake polymer. It's just a viscosifier and, right. and nothing else. No, no, no shear thinning, no absorption, no residual resistance factor. In fact, other, other calculations we're doing right now include all of the above in, and, and, some, and some quite complex rheology as well, including elasticity, actually, uh, proper elasticity. Uh, so so uh, we, we're looking at other things as well, but not in this one. But if you want to ask about them, I know a little bit. Well, um, yes, I, I would explain from, from physical uh, you know, point of view, when you do have the absorption, you're going to have even more um, enhanced um, visual fingering because of the denuded water. And then, the, the, of course, the mobility of the water, I'm expecting pretty much the, the viscous finger to resemble very much the water uh, yes. because the polymer is going to be lagged behind. That's right, yeah. 
I, I wonder whether you have done uh, or you plan to do any experiments on that. Uh, oh yeah, the, the experiments, the experiments are, let me just be clear here, the experiments are done. The experiments okay. have been done with polyacrylamides, in fact, that if you look at the re references in the paper that I'm going to send, uh, that uh, Leah has, uh, experiments like that, exactly like that, have been done. So the, the thing, uh, the reason I didn't present to you some matches of experiments is because we've got to fix all those things like adsorption, residual resistance factor, etc. Uh, but but the, the, the basic finding, even for uh, just a, a viscous glycerol-like polymer, still holds it still holds you, you you're absolutely your first conjecture was completely correct you actually get some uh, retardation of the uh, polymer mm. and you get even more uh, water in front of it which fingers anyway right. so you the, the, those fingers are actually conic water banking and then fingering right and that happens yeah yeah okay yes this, this is just kind of wanted to see whether we have done some experiments or whether the experiments does actually support the, the the reason behind the physical uh, you know mechanism. oh yes and, and the actual fact if you get uh, uh, what i'd say sensible numbers i don't know if you know the numbers but if you're getting numbers like 20 to 30 40 uh, uh, micrograms per gram type absorption for typical polyacrylamides for, for, or for good polyacrylamides well solubilized ones then the retardation is not that much it's, it's sort of like a fraction of a pore volume so the, the effect is there definitely there and you do see the enhanced fingering but it still is okay it's still you still get very good recovery Right. On the other hand, one of the things about polyacrylamide, it still goes right down the backbone of the water flood, mm -hmm. and it still it does show some additional elastic additional effects, viscous right. effects for cross flow. So it, it actually still works very well. Right. Okay. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Yang Zhou is next. I don't know if I'm pronouncing. Can I can I see these? Maybe if I do. Uh... Yang Xiao, yeah, so where do you go? Moving around on me. Oh, unmute. Do you want me to just read yours or do you want to ask it yourself, Yang? Well, well, we're waiting. This microphone. I can see the chat now, actually. I'll just come out. Okay, so I'll just read it out loud for everybody. I Yang Zhao says, I also observed KR not greater than one at SWI for heavy oil. I kind of I guess what you're talking about before, Ken. Yeah. Do you have some comments on the representative extensional rheology measurements to the in situ viscosity? I guess there was almost a lot of the question you just answered. Yeah. Any other comments or? Uh, no, just that uh, th 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 there are effects. Well, I'll put it this way. There are additional elastic effects. In fact, recently we did a, a, a pore scale paper trying to explain why uh, uh, polychrylamide, why xanthan, uh, glycerol, and uh, were uh, showing the effects they did. And we could, we could reproduce them using combinations of shear thinning, shear thinning, thickening, etc. Uh, uh, so, so yes, there are those, uh, those effects are definitely in there. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? Please raise your hand or just jump in. We'll do it for like 15, uh, 20, 20 more seconds here, half a minute. I want to thank Ken again. This has been an excellent talk, Ken. Again, great way to, to lead us off this semester. Um, I assume you guys are all locked down or all uh, remote in the UK also. Is that correct? Yeah, we are. We're still, well, our labs are, uh, the experimental guys are back in. I'm going to go back in next week for the first time. Uh, so, you know, take my chances, yeah. So again, uh, it looks like there's no more questions. So um, I might ring you myself, Ken, to get, uh, talk a little bit more specifically. But uh, no, no, sure. Yeah, you're more than welcome, actually. Look, thank you very much, everybody, for your attention. Very nice. Thanks for those questions. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank